start up, everybody. Welcome back. Um, today we're going to go through some computational issues, so I'll start getting underneath the hood. Did you wear that just to bother me? <laughs> Zach. So, my rival. So, no. Okay. You see <laughs> So right in the front. People used to arrive on the chalkboard in my early days. So Carolina show. So if you guys in Carolina, that's fine. I, I got my PhD in so. Oh, it's not quite basketball season yet. So. Okay, we're gonna go under the hood of this code. Let me just remind you kind of what it does. So it's MCMC, so there's just two steps right here. What I'm going to be implementing is a Gibbs within Metropolis scheme. It might be worth it just to write this on the board real quick, um, since you might not know exactly what I'm doing. But this is what the code does. Base so code. And it's going to be a Gibbs within Metropolis. And sometimes you'll hear it say the other way around, metropolis within gigs. Okay, they're together. So, and sometimes you won't hear people say these things, but they usually mean it. So I'll just say gigs plus. And so our example is going to be x's come from a normal distribution with some mean, we want to learn it, and some variance. But I'm going to just write it down on the precision. So that's how I'm doing all my updating. And so I get to see the end data points. We'll see what the issues are here as we increase n. Theoretically, that's a good thing. When you go to code something, you can bog down your code and slow everything down. If you're not careful about it, it can also possibly create some numerical instabilities. So on one hand, it's a good thing. But on the other hand, you have to be and so we're going to be learning our posterior. So our goal is to learn whatever this distribution is. Mu, B, given X. And this thing is going to be proportional to B to the N over 2 minus 1. So that part's from my prior. You should be used to that. E to the minus one half, and I'll throw my phi over here, phi over two, sum of the x size minus mu squared. And so that's what my posterior looks like. So this is the prior bit. Just to be really clear, my prior was pi mu and phi was proportional to one over. So if you want me to multiply by that by one for the prior on mu, I'm using a flat prior there. You can imagine that it's there. This used to confuse me. The first time I ever saw this, I was like, where's me? You know, this is an invalid equation. And so in a lot of Bayesians, we'll just jump to that real quick. But now we understand it. Um, we could change the prior and use other priors in here. Um, but typically, I just use that in this sort of we will be coming around to um, Jeffrey's priors. This is the Jeffrey's prior on precision, and then the Jeffrey's prior on mu is one. But I'm going to point out this isn't the joint Jeffrey's prior. We'll be talking about that later. The nice thing about Jeffrey's prior is it's just calculation. So once I tell you how to do the calculation, those are the easiest problems in the world, so long as you just remember the formula. So I'll tell you what the formula is, what it represents, where comes from, so on and so forth, and that's probably on either next time or Friday, at least by Friday. So we want to learn this whole thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement a Gibbs sampler. So Gibbs looks like this. For T goes from 1 to cap T, I'm going to sample mu's from its posterior distribution. Um, this is going to be Whatever this thing is, we know what it is. It's a normal distribution with mean x bar and variance 1 over phi times n. So we know 
this is a normal x bar 1 over p n. Of course, what we do with this right here is we have to plug in some value and we're trying to learn it. So we plug in our last step right here. So this will need to be initialized early on. And then we're going to update p. And it's going to come from its distribution. It's full conditional. And it's going to be conditioned on mu. And we're going to condition on our most current value. And we know on this one right here, what distribution this is. This is a gamma has parameters n over 2, and this is going to be sum of the xi's minus mu t divided by n. No n divided by 2. How do I do that? I kind of just form the likelihood in my head and I can see what it is because I know where the arguments are. So that's what that thing is. And so keep in mind the um, mean of this thing is going to be this thing over that thing. So the twos cancel. And it looks like the estimate for variance that you would normally use inverted. So it looks like the invert of the NLE, the expectation of this. So it kind of makes sense. So those are the sanity checks that I always do. This is squared. Squared, yeah. Thanks, Mark. So some sanity checks don't catch you, don't help you from making the squared thing. You'll do that in your code all the time. So I always recommend when you're coding something up, you code up a little tiny bit. You make sure that it's working and doing what you think that it's working before you proceed to the next step. So if you try to do everything all at once, like I used to do when I was a kid, you will spend a very, very, very long time debugging. But it used to be this game of, can I get it to compile? You know, oh, finally compiles, it must be right. Oh, big mistake. So. So I'm going to pretend like I don't know these. So what you would do is you would just update this. This would be t, this would be t. I just run this until convergence. So what am I checking to see what converges? I'm checking the distribution. So I can check anything in the distribution. There's lots of proxies for checking for convergence. Did the mean converge? Did the variance converge? You know, did the skewness of it converge? Did the whole distribution converge? What I recommend doing is you always monitor whatever you're reporting. So if you're reporting something, you make sure that that is converged. You should run it until the entire thing converges in all aspects. So um, saying that, if you're reporting something, make sure it's right. So what do I mean? You run it for a long time, and you see that whatever those things are aren't changing. So what I usually check for this Myself is I check the total variational distance and make sure that's not moving. So the whole distribution is not moving, and I do it in bins. There's other proxies. Some people will just check the means of the distribution, the joint mean, and see that that's converged. That's a lot like doing an anode index, if you know about anode. The only difference with that is these are not IID samples, and so there's a correction factor on the dependence that you see in this Markovian. Um, those are called the gelman rubin statistics. We'll be talking about those a little bit later. So right now, for your homework, when you run things to convergence, usually we make a trace plot, and we look at those, and we visually inspect them. So right now, I think it's good enough that we visually inspect our trace plot because our problems are fairly low dimensional, and we can kind of do that. Um, if you're writing a journal article, they're going to say we want a little bit more than the idle. So there are statistics that you can report. Um, I'll talk about those later in class. I'll assume that you're not writing your paper right away. Okay, I'm going to pretend like I don't have any idea what these distributions are. So I don't get to know that. I don't have a button where I get to sample from that distribution. Um, I will kind of fictitiously say I do know how to sample from a normal. That's what I'm going to use as my proposal. 
you'll kind of realize that's a little bit absurd because if I know how to sample from a normal, then I know how to sample from that. Um, I'm just going to pretend I have no idea what that distribution is. And all I know is this form. I need, um, I'll write this down, posterior B given X is proportional to B to the N over 2 minus 1 E to the minus B over 2 squared residuals. X size minus U squared. So I just know that. I know that because I know what the likelihood is. I can write it down in closed form. And I know what the priors are. I can multiply those. So a piece of paper. And in a lot of um, problems you'll be working on, you'll know all this stuff. You'll be able to write it. Um, I'm going to assume we're going to do a metropolis step here. I have you play around with both on your homework. If I did know these distributions, everything will converge in like two iterations. But the way I'm going to set it up is going to at least detail, you, detail for you some tuning issues that you need to think about. So I'm plaguing this code so that you can understand what convergence looks like and how you tune it. I don't want you to see for your first example everything working perfectly because in most applications, things don't work this way. Okay, the MH step is gonna look like this. So I'm gonna propose mu from some proposal distribution, G mu, given mu T minus one. And I'm going to let this thing be a normal distribution. It's going to be centered where I was last time. And I'm going to have some tuning parameter right here. And so what that tuning parameter is going to do is it's going to help me think about if I want to move very far from my answers that I've already seen or if I want to stay close to them. So it's really a, a question of ambition. So are you really ambitious in your proposal, or do you just want to keep toe around the space? Uh, both have repercussions. So second step is to decide, I compute this probability, min 1. I'm going to take my, this thing right here, dt minus 1, put a condition on x. This is a lot different from sampling from this distribution. I'm just evaluating. So this is going to be at my proposed location compared to where I was. So I'm just going to be plugging things into a formula, things that I know. And then with this proposal right here, you'll notice that it's symmetric. So I'll just say this is a symmetric proposal right here. And so the proposal cancels out. I.e., if I flip this with that in the equation, it's the same equation. So I'll just write that down real quick. Recall. That G X star, I'll say mu star, given mu T minus 1, This is just going to be equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi, psi, my tuning parameter, e to the minus 1 half, mu t, mu star minus mu t minus 1, squared over psi squared. I'm letting psi represent the variance for us. Um, this thing is equal to g mu t minus 1 given mu star. So this would be the backwards proposal, going backwards in space. So when I take the ratio of these two things right here, it cancels out, and it becomes 1. I'll just write that down if you'd like to see it. So times 1, that's the ratio of my inverse proposal. So it's a symmetric proposal. We're going to do something similar here. But the question is, is what is the proposal? We're going to do a metropolis tasting step in both spots. So here's its MH step. So 
what I'm going to do first is I'm going to propose phi star is going to come from some function for phi. It might have something to do with where I was last time. How would you guys pick this? Let's just hear some guesses. You might be right, you might be wrong, you might pick something that does work, it might not be efficient, but it's good to hear uh, different guesses when you talk about the issues. What would you pick? Maybe a gamma. So which gamma? So maybe a gamma. Why a gamma? Yeah, it's positive. So it keeps everything positive. It'd be a little bit funny if you saw somebody do this in reality because the full conditional is a gamma, so you know which one you should pick. It turns out if you do use the full conditional, the whole metropolis ratio is one. The decision rule is one. The probability is one. You'll always accept it. I'll ask you to verify that at some point during this class. So, which gamma? So maybe just any old gamma, right? It covers the space. And so maybe just, well, I don't know, I'll just pick it. So it's positive. You will have a problem if that proposal doesn't overlap your target very well. You'll be rejecting a lot of samples. And you can play around with that and see what the repercussions are on your homework. Um, it could work well if you happen to know about where everything was. So you maybe centered everything around the NLE. Maybe it would work. It probably works okay. So, what about some other guesses? A log normal. So that's also positive. So, log normals, just keep in mind. You're not when you log a normal because that wouldn't make sense. You get negative values if you be logging. So when you log this distribution, log transform it, it becomes normal. It's actually e to the normal rules. And that's something that's very positive. So a log normal, same exact issue. You'd have to think about where to center it, and it may or may not work the greatest, but it probably work okay as long as you've centered it properly. So a log normal, totally valid. So you're thinking about step one, at least make sure you're in the same space as what you're sampling. Any other guesses? Okay, there's a couple things that people do. Um, and they'll talk about this in this article that I'm gonna show you is, um, so I'll say maybe a log normal. Those are all valid. And at least in theory land, everything works out great, you know? So asymptotically, this thing will converge under both of your guesses um, in theory. So if you did center it very far away from where everything happens, no computer will get this to do. Um, there's some other possibilities that people will do, is sometimes people will deal with the precision parameter on the log scale. So they'll log transform it. And when you do that, so taking the log of something positive, you put it into both the negative and positive spaces. So when those values are less than one, you get negative values. So now maybe if you did work with it on the log scale, you could use this symmetric proposal strategy. And that's one way to deal with it. And another way is to use the same sort of idea that we have here that I'm going to use a normal that's going to be centered at where I was last time, but I truncated. And that's what I've done in my code. So maybe a truncated normal. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take V star and I'm going to get it from a normal distribution centered at where I was last time. So long as I'm spitting out stuff that's valid in my algorithm, positive values, I'll be able to use this strategy. And so I'll have some other tuning parameter. I'll call this psi for p. I can tune that. And I need to make sure this thing is positive. So I'm just going to denote that with an indicator function where I'm going to say p is greater than zero. That's an indicator. 
Let me ask you a question. Is this distribution symmetric? Let me just write down what it looks like. So what this thing visually looks like is, let's say I'm centered right here, Vt minus 1. So there's some normal distribution around here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to truncate this stuff out. So I just have this function right here. So this thing looks like this. E to the, let me give myself a little bit more room. E to the minus one half. I've got my variance parameter per psi. And then I have B star minus B T minus one squared. Is this thing symmetric in V? What's wrong? The indicator function. So there's something off here. If I just look at the kernel of this and I flip these two parameters around, it looks like it's symmetric at a glance. But that's truncation, it's changing everything right here. And so I'm getting rid of this stuff right here. And what happens is I need to raise this up a little bit. The normalizing constants are different. And so this actually has a constant in here. So the normalizing constant And the normalizer changes depending on what t minus 1 is, how much I shift this thing. So when I shift it, it's changing how much I need to raise this thing up and down. Usually that normalizing constant is just 1 over square root 2 pi. It has the parameter in here. But that's going to change every single time because this thing has to normalize to 1. I'll show you an article that discusses this. I've left that part out, and so I've invalidated my code, making the mistake that it's symmetric. I make a note in my code, I'll post it for you with the correction as well. You guys can fix it in your homework. So that's what my code's gonna do, is I'm gonna try to sample from this, but I do a Metropolis Hastings step. So I do update the value every single time. It might be where I currently am, or my proposed value. Same thing here. So I'll have an acceptance step that's here, right here as well. So let's look at the code. Okay. Just like Why don't the constants just cancel out when you're looking at the acceptance as well? So if I have this right here. So this is a truncated normal right here. Here's another one. Let me, let me draw them so that they're oh, okay. yeah, So let me do this the same. So try to draw this with the same. These are supposed to be the same shapes, just shifted. So this right here, let's say this has area if I use the 1 over square root 2 pi for my normalizer. I need to, and let's say that was right at the center of this distribution. I have to multiply that by 2 to make sure that there's area 1 under here. This one shifted a lot further to the right, and so I need to multiply by something that's smaller than that to get this to integrate to 1. So it's just those normalizing constants that are different, and in this case, they don't cancel. So easy mistake for people to make. One of our friends wrote us a nice little article about that. I'll show you this article, and then we'll look at it.
I'll post this for you. Metropolis Hastings and MCMC with proposals and targets have different support. So they talk about using maybe a truncated distribution. They're going to do Metropolis on this distribution. Does it look familiar to you? Yeah, it's an exponential. It's also a type of gamma. So this has a one right there. It's some sort of a um, exponential. So I recognize that way too. So they talk about these proposal distributions. So they have pi as their target. I'm using G as my proposal. They have F as their proposal. And so they talk about the metropolis variant when this thing is symmetric and it cancels out. That's just this part of the rule right here. Correct implementation. And they kind of talk about it for sampling from this distribution. And if everything runs really well, he's able to draw this. This is the question that Jenny was saying. If you could just draw it, why do you have to do all the sampling? Because in high D and spaces where you don't know where things live, and you're not able to draw everything. So if you sample everything and you normalize the histogram, everything works great right here. He used a truncated proposal on this, and he added the correct term in there. He tells you what this term looks like. He tells you what an incorrect sampler is when you remove everything. Um, and it looks like this. So this is the conversation we were having with Danielle at the beginning. Does everything get invalidated? If I forgot to add in this term, this is what the histogram looks like compared to the actual answer. They're super close. So on average, that term is about one. So if this thing, now it depends. Obviously, if I have a precision that slams right up to the border, we're going to not see as good of results as this. So, so long as you don't have a precision that's really, really small, tiny, um, this, you'll get some answer that's kind of good. So ultimately, they say include the normalizing constant in here. So what is the normalizing constant in a um, normal distribution that you need to multiply to by it's the inverse CDF or it's the CDF function for everything and you can compute that and that's what's right here so they have this CDF term and so you can read through this and they'll tell you how to correct the same it's basically the correct normalizing constant is going in there they have it written out in terms of the normal 0 1 C here something that you can evaluate it's called the ERF function the error function so have you ever seen in that lab ERF this thing. Um, they say correct everything up, put in the correct normalizing constant, and everything gets fixed in the end. Of the day. Okay, so I want you to think about that, so I'm going to leave it in my code. It's a little bit of a mistake, so if you want to recycle some of my code in your homework, I guess that's fine. You should probably try to code it up yourself so that you can see how many mistakes you make before you get the right thing. So I'd encourage that. But definitely, you have a little bit of correction. Okay, I'll be posting that. Let's go to my code. Just start looking at this. Let me just run it one more time for you so you can see what happens. I've already initialized all my x's, true mu, true sigma. They're the same values as last time. And I'm just gonna run this thing. And so there's some burn-in period and it's running relatively fast. And it's tracked everything down and it's converging. It's gonna Staying converged. I'll just point out a few other things after this finishes running. So I get to see my two dimensional trace plot. What I normally do is I usually look at the trace plots in one dimension. And so this is clearly burn in period, and then it kind of stays stationary. It's in some distributional range and it stays there. Um, of course, I want to chop off the burn-in period before I report the answers. So these don't look like, this doesn't look like a normal distribution right here, or sorry, it should be a T distribution. And this certainly doesn't look gamma because of the burn-in is in there. It looks all right. So still want to chop this thing off. So phi converged very fast and it took longer for me to converge. And if you ended up looking at the tails of that distribution, you would see that it's a little steeper in the space. So it wants to run up those. So it gets the most increase out of those. Kind of interesting. So you get to see the trajectory that it takes. So 
Let's just look at what my code is doing. So a lot of this is just plotting and um, setting some controls where I want to initialize everything. So I have some initializers right here, and I can play around with those. Um, I pad everything so that my code works a little bit faster. MATLAB is smart enough to figure out how to add space on the fly, but I think it's good practice going to have that space yourself. We'll see. Initialize, plug in my initializers into my vector of pre-allocated space. I do some plotting for you, so I tell you where I'm starting from. I show you where the truth is, just so that you can see it. And then there's just basically these two steps right here. So I'm just going to iterate over this, these two steps. So I'm going to update the mean, and that all happens right here. I want to point out I'm doing everything on the logarithm scale. So I've taken the logarithm of everything that I'm using in here. So I'm not just plugging in my likelihood function. And keep in mind, if I take my likelihood function times my prior, and I hold a value fixed in there, that's going to be proportional to the whole condition. So joint distributions where you hold a value fixed looks like the shape of the conditional distributions, the slice through that distribution. And so I don't have to work out any full conditionals. I just take the joint and I hold the value fixed. It's not normalized correctly, but in the ratio, all the normalizing constants cancel. So there's nothing really to do. All I have to do is take this value and hold the d fixed in both the numerator and the denominator. I've done everything on the logarithms logarithm scale because I wanted to show you that this thing works right here. Um, so what I've done is I've taken a log of that, but I did it algebraically. And I wrote it all down. And it looks like this right here. So it's just the exponent terms in here. The fees don't matter in this step. So the fee is canceling out anyway. It's fixed in the numerator and the denominator. So all I'm looking at is this part. So when I take the logarithm, I just have this term right here, this parabolic term. And that's what you see right up there. And so I'm keeping in mind to do everything on the logarithm scale. So I compute my proposed value. So I propose something. I've used a symmetric proposal. I have some scaling factors in here so I can slow it up or turn it down. We'll play around with those in a second. Um, but when I'm doing everything on the ratio scale, because it's on a logarithmic scale, I'm looking at the difference between these two things. And then here's my decision rule. Here's how I've coded it up. So I want to just point out, I do that on the logarithmic scale as well. This would be an easy place for somebody to make a mistake. So here's how I do it. So I normally have this step right here where I take beta star. I'll just move to something more, well, we can say what beta is. Let's call it mu. So mu star, it comes from g. Right there, and then I end up doing this sort of thing, where I compute my alpha. Alpha is equal to the min of one in this stuff right here. So it's that, and I plug in, and then I make my update. Mu t is going to be equal to mu star with probability alpha, or mu 2 minus 1 with probability 1 minus alpha. The way I always code this up, is I usually don't invoke a Bernoulli sampler to do that. You can do that if you want. But I usually do something like this. If, and I end up sampling the uniform, 0, 1, I usually check if u, so not mu, that's a u, is less than or equal to my ratio, which is alpha in this case. And so if this is true, then I take my next mu and I make it mu star. Else, I take ut. And then I set it equal to where I was last time. You do not reject it, you stick around. So if you're sticking around, it's increasing the, the frequency in your samples of that value. It's telling you it's an important value. So 
we have to update some maps so we stick around. So let's just think about this real quickly. If this number was 0.5 right here, what's the probability that a uniform 0, 1 is less than a number 0. 0.5? 0. 0.5. And so any number I pick, if this was like 0. 0.72, what's the probability that a uniform is less than 0. 0.72? It's 0. 0.72. And so this is the Bernoulli point of the disguise. It's actually the inverse CDF method. So if you're familiar with that, what I'm doing is I'm taking the CDF from uh, Bernoulli. I'm inverting it. And this is that sampler. So if you take the inverse function, you plug it in, a uniform 0, 1 into that, it ends up spitting out a random value from that distribution. Either you know that or you don't. Um, if you take in my inference class, work that out of the problem once upon a time. Um, fun sampler. Problem with that sampler is most distributions, you can't work out the CDF and you can't work out the inverse of the CDF. So a normal distribution is a good example of that. So you can't work out the CDF in closed form, so you can't convert it, you can't do that trick. It also doesn't work in high dimensional spaces. It works in one dimensional spaces. So this is what I usually do. On the log scale, I take my uniform, 0, 1. I do something similar. I take the logarithm of my uniform, and I check to see if it's less than the logarithm of alpha. Same thing. Mu t is going to be mu star. In this case, else ut is going to be equal to ut. So in all my Metropolis samplers, I have some block of code that looks like this. And that's how I make my decision. So log is a monotonic function. So taking it to both sides preserves everything, so this works. I'll just point out, I don't actually compute alpha and then take the log of it. So if alpha is numerically contaminated, taking the log of it will not work. So I do a little bit of algebra up front and figure out what everything is on the log scale, like I've done here. And then I take the difference in the ratio. And that's going to be the thing that I plug in here. So I always call this my ratio, but it's really a log ratio that I'm plugging in right there. Um, we'll play around with this in a second and see how it works when I remove the logging of everything. Then I do the same thing down here. So for P. I make a note that this isn't a symmetric proposal. There's a mistake in this step. So you can come in and correct that by multiplying by the ratios of the CDF function. Patrick? Is that why the histogram plots you're making don't converge to the true? They, no, the reason why that those histograms didn't look good is because I had the burn-in shoved in there. So they would look very, very nice if I removed the burn-in. We'll see that in a second. So you can't detect the difference with your eye. So no, that's not the reason. It's because I'm plotting everything with Bernie. Um, you said it's going to be uniform because it's more robust. You can, you can do this log transformation term as well as, or is it a speed thing? It's just a speed thing. Okay. So I can sample a uniform real quickly. And so this is the fastest way I know how to sample from a Bernoulli. So I can do the Bernoulli point flip. So it's just anything I'm going to do, I'm going to sample the uniform anyway. So that's the name of the game. We transform uniforms into other things. The Metropolis is doing that in a real sophisticated way. Um, so same thing. You know, I've got everything computed on a log scale right here, and I do everything on the logarithmic scale. Everything else is just plotting. It's plotting the answer so you can see the trajectory. Yes, please. Can you use a mu t when you're updating the period? Yes. Um, so if you were updating in the log instead of doing the sort of thing, how would you do the, how would you choose the proposal? I would probably choose the same proposal that I have already. And I'd just be sampling my mu, and then I would sample my, my fee using the same proposal strategy. Do that in one step together. 
on mu, it would still be symmetric, so it would cancel out of the ratio, and I'd still be left with that one decision. I'd be updating both things together. So I'd have my mu star and my phi star plugged in in the numerator, and then I'd have mu t minus one and phi t minus one, you know, plugged in. And I think I asked you to do that on your homework. So same sort of strategy. So I would be taking independent proposals for each one, because I wouldn't know anything about their joint relationship. And that's what I would actually do. Um, I think doing everything on the log transform scale for phi is probably faster than doing this truncated normal thing, but most people do the truncated normal. Everything else is plotting. So let's just see how this works. Well, we've seen it. What I kind of want to do right now is take out the logarithm and let's just see how it works real quickly. Now, I'm going to um, just do this manually. So boom, boom, comment, comment, and here's my last part. Now I'm on the ratio scale. And now I just need to replace this log right here. So I've removed everything from the log scale. I want to show you this thing working pretty well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize everything at the truth, which is cheating. But you'll notice that this thing works probably adequately. So let's just have a look. Kind of works. Doesn't look great, though. There's something horribly wrong with it. And so it's kind of making a numerical error in here, in this part, when phi is very, very small. And this thing kind of looks pretty crummy. Now, if I made n much, much smaller, it'd probably work OK. And so if you just think about that e to the minus stuff, any time you see e in your computer code, you should freak out and think, I can't actually evaluate that. You're going to reach a limit where you can't evaluate that very quickly. And so the correction to this is just to do everything on a uh, logarithmic scale. Let's just see how well this works if I start really far away from the true. So that's if I initialize everything at the true. I'm going to start everything pretty far away from the true. Let's see how this works. This thing is still in nowhere close to the true. So it's kind of, oh, it kind of got there. That's kind of nice. There's some semblance in there of this thing working. So it kind of got there. So we're like, yay, maybe it's working. But it doesn't work that well. If I zoom in to these samples again, we're going to see that same gap that's forming. And that's because every time it sees that, it computes like something like infinity. And it messes up for a second. So if you ever see infinity, you should be throwing an error message to yourself. So it kind of worked a little bit. I just want to point out, if I resample the whole bunch of values right here, 200, I don't think this thing will work at all. So let's just run it again. It's trying to do some convergence. Running it for a pretty long time. Run this. You wait, you wait, you wait, you wait, you wait. And in hard problems, you're waiting for like a week. You come back and you see this. You're like, doesn't work at all. So again, I think for problems that you're trying to solve, you probably want to build a simulator. Simulate the data out of the distributions that you think it's coming from and make sure that it's working. The problem is, in all of this, is my function looks like this, v to the n over 2 minus 1, e to the minus p over 2, sum of the xi's minus mu right here. So what I'm doing is I'm plugging in some numbers right here. So this would be my pt minus 1, and this would be my pt minus 1 value right here. So both of those I'm plugging in there. So if I start very far away 
from where I previously was, this thing is never going to update. So my XIs are going to be very, very far away from my views in all of this. Sorry, this would be mu t minus 1. This thing would cancel. I wouldn't need that in the ratio because I'm just updating that. But this is going to be too far away with respect to whatever I've initialized that. So these are going to be huge numbers. E to the minus something huge is going to floor it out to zero. So I'm really doing a divide by zero mistake every single time, and the code will never get there. So to save you a lot of headaches, always do your metropolis on a log scale. Let's just fix it up. That's what this does. And we'll see that this thing is going to work with my 200 samples starting from very far away. So starting from very far away, come down here, see if I can even see my code. Boom, boom. So taking the log afterwards doesn't help you. So algebraically, like everything is, I guess what I should have done, I've actually made a mistake because this was both supposed to be on the log scale. Let me just do this one more time. This should have been minus still, and that should have been a log. Let's run this one more time. Same thing. It won't work. I made a mistake because I, I didn't, I actually still had it on log scale because I had those log evaluations. Sorry about that. Real time demo. Just wait for this. It's still not going to converge. So taking the logarithm doesn't help you at all. Boom. And so same garbage. Let's just fix it up and algebraically do it all on the log scale. So, boom. Algebraically, everything's the same, but on the computer, it's wildly different. Rerun this. It's done a pretty good job. It's already found the truth. So, I'm starting very, very far away from everything. We'll run this just one more time, and then I'll relieve you all. So, boom. That's actually right. So remember, it's changed the shape, but I used 200 samples in everything. And so it's becoming rounder and rounder. We see the triangular shape fall off. You can play around with that. It burned in very quickly. I'm going to set my burn in. So basically, I'm just going to start this thing at the truth again to answer Patrick's question. But if we start in the stationary region, I'll just say plus one plus one, so it's at least close to stationarity. And I run this thing with burn in, I'll say 3,000, because it probably is going to burn in really quickly. It runs, bang. It will run if I start far away. It will run if I start close, because everything's numerically stable. What I'm going to do, Patrick, is I'm going to chop off that trajectory off. You're not supposed to report that part because that's not stationary yet. We'll do a little bit of theory next time. And here's how everything works. So here's my trace plots for mu, and here's my trace plots for phi. And here's my histogram. So can these converge? It looks like to me they have. I've chopped off all of that stuff. I just plotted it for you. It converged really fast. Everything overlaps. This is the distribution that I should have got. And so the joint samples have this relationship to them. And I can report that as well. Next time I want to come back and show you just a little bit of more practical details of tuning this thing. So we haven't talked about the step size much. So I want to come back in 10 minutes and talk about the step size. And then I'm going to give you some more options too. So I'm going to teach you about detailed balance and show you how you prove these samplers. That's it for now, you guys.